great to have all of you here today and understand what we're really faced with in not only our community, but the communities around us. So it's, 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 it's amazing. Uh, we've got a, a great thing happening here in Menominee, Wisconsin called Project Hope. Project Hope gives families and individuals and those in need the opportunity for, for a better way out, or a better way of dealing with it. When the Chief Atkinson, the Menominee Police Chief, uh, was hired a few years back, um, it was my uh, opportunity to sit down at, uh, in my office and, and talk with the Chief and say, you know what Chief, here's three things that I can identify in Menominee that are really important to not only me, but also the community. One of those things is community-based police officers, meaning our, our cops are mingling in the community and our community can place trust in our officers. Uh, another thing was hire good cops. You know, don't second guess. We don't want to second guess our cops. There's always an incident that comes along that we need the best cops we can possibly get. And the third thing is, we've got a situation in Menominee and the, and the surrounding communities dealing with methamphetamines and, and, and other um, drug addictions uh, as a general uh, term. So that being said, the chief and I had about an hour and a half meeting and we discussed those um, projects. And, and, and in the last few years, he's come up with the solutions to all of those situations. Number one, we do have community-based policing here in Menominee, which is second to none. Our cops get along with our community, our community trusts our cops, and that's amazing. Number two is, we do have the best cops, I think, in the area. Um, again, second to none. And thirdly, he has come up with a program to deal with uh, methamphetamine and drug addiction in Menominee that I think is worthy of of not only our community, but other communities to be involved in also. Uh, hopefully someday, uh, with all the help of the, the surrounding communities, perhaps this could be a state initiative, and maybe we can really help families not only across Wisconsin, maybe even the nation. Um, that being said, Project Hope um, has got so much going for it. Uh, the City Council a few years ago backed the project, put money into a fund. Then the Chief of Police, uh, Eric Atkinson, took it over and really excelled the program and made it worthy of what it is today. And we just want to move that program forward uh, to, to the highest expectations that we can get it. And, and that being said, um, there's so many benefits to Project Hope. And, and the police chief and others will cover that today, but I'm just thrilled as the mayor and, and as a lifelong resident of Menominee, Wisconsin, to have Project Hope in our city and have it a working program. Not only just, you know, we're going to talk about doing this, or we're going to do that, or this is a program that really works. And the more involvement we can get by all of the players in our communities around us, the better this program will work. So I encourage you to be involved with our Chief of Police. I employ you to be involved with our Chief of Police and his, his uh, helpers and so forth. Uh, it's a, I've known people growing up. Um, I grew up in Menominee, Wisconsin. I've had friends that have gotten addicted to methamphetamines. I've had uh, people call me and talk about their kids or their, their neighbors or their employers or their employees and, and methamphetamines and, and other drug uh, addictions. We have to get a handle on it. And so I totally encourage you to support uh, Project Hope and its initiatives. And uh, with that, uh, Chief of Police, uh, Eric Atkinson, I'll turn the microphone over to you and thank you again for being here today. Chief? Thank you, thank you Eric. Greetings, everyone, and good afternoon. My name is Eric Atkinson, and I'm the Chief of Police for the Menominee Police Department. It's an absolute honor to be in front of you today to talk about Project Hope. And the mayor, he gives me a lot of credit. Really, the credit goes to all of our community partners that have made this possible, both public and private. And it took years of research, training, education, building friendships, building those partnerships to really create a collaborative model that we have here today which is Project Hope. And Project Hope was designed based on four strategic pillars. Prevention, treatment, harm reduction, and enforcement. And really in simple terms, what we're trying to do is discover what is the root cause of substance use disorders, addictions, and how they impact crime and quality of life, not just in Menominee, but in the greater Chippewa Valley area. In order to accomplish the daunting task of trying to reduce substance use disorders, co-occurring disorders, 
must really come up with evidence-based solutions that do not have unintended consequences for the people that we're trying to serve. Today, we're going to talk about two such initiatives inside the umbrella of Project Hope as a collaborative partnership with Dunn County, Our Place Incorporated, and a variety of other both private and public entities. First one, it's called the Quick Response Team. The Quick Response Team is not something that was invented by me. It was actually invented by a fellow in the back of the room, along with, a, along with his collaborative partnership in Ohio. The Quick Response Team is a team made up of law enforcement, social workers, peer advisors, paramedics. They usually go out in teams of three. They've identified people who have survived non-fatal overdoses or who have a high risk for overdose or we know are severely addicted to methamphetamines and other controlled substances. That team in turn goes out in the field and meets with those individuals and offers them services, tries to help create a pathway to treatment. But it isn't just treatment, but it's providing the necessary support, encouragement, and motivation to be able to seek out that treatment. They're in plain clothes, they're specially trained to work with people that have substance use disorders and co-occurring disorders. They're trained in areas of neuroscience of addiction, motivational interviewing, crisis intervention, integration and communications and tactics, essentially de-escalation practices. And then utilizing skill sets of counselors, peer advisors, social workers, and medical professionals, they try to guide people into treatment and into our treatment providers like Arbor Place Incorporated. Once a person decides to accept help and treatment, that person gets to largely choose however they want to get that kind of service. We'll, we'll deliver the person directly to Arbor Place to have an assessment whether inpatient or outpatient services are needed. If there's economic support that is needed, we help provide that as well and connect them with economic support specialists at Dunn County. And from there, what we do is we provide what we call wraparound services. And those wraparound services may consist of just checking in with the person every day to see how they're doing. It may be helping them overcome barriers. We know that transportation can be a barrier. We know that Basics such as food and shelter can be a barrier. And we help connect those people to those resources. So that way, they can try to overcome their substance use disorder and be as successful as possible. And we do this while trying to preserve their dignity and respect and remove the stigma of addiction. The other initiative that we are beginning today is also called the Angels of Red Cedar, or the ARC Initiative. What the Angels of Red Cedar is, is another opportunity for creating a pathway to treatment. Individuals who have substance use disorders can come to safe spaces designated in our county, in Menominee Police Department, Menominee Fire Department, and the Dunn County Sheriff's Office. Individuals can come there, they can turn in their drugs, their paraphernalia, <clears throat> if they so wish, without fear of being arrested or prosecution. And then we help bring them to treatment providers. We offer the same kind of services we do with the Quick Response Team. Those communities that have implemented such programs as the Quick Response Team, and the Angels of Red Cedar, or an angel program, which is more commonly referred to around the country, they've seen reduced deaths and overdoses, reductions in crime, and improved quality of life. I think we can all agree that that's important for not just Menominee, Dunn County, and the greater Chippewa Valley area. I'm extremely proud of these programs, and I'm extremely proud of the collaborative partnership that we have built 
over the years. I am confident that these programs and initiatives will help reduce crime, help improve quality of life, and, and let's be honest, folks, it'll, it'll help save lives. And that there's no, no greater purpose than preserving someone's life. What I'd like to do is turn the microphone over to two behavioral health officers, Officer Aaron Byrne and Deputy Becca Merrifield. They can tell you a little bit about their experience with the infield activities, or out in the field activities, I should say, for a quick response team and how they've helped develop these initiatives. So with that, please welcome Officer Byrne and Deputy Merrifield. Um, my name is Aaron Burton, and I began this year I was appointed as a behavioral health officer and decided to start uh, training myself uh, in motivational interviewing and several other uh, uh, related uh, topics uh, to what we do. Uh, Chief Atkinson asked us to come up and, and have a little discussion or share with you some of the experiences that I've had. And, and while this is relatively new, I, there's a couple that stand out to me. Um, first is a young woman who uh, was suffering from uh, prescription abuse. And uh, essentially, one of the goals that we try to do is we try to meet people where they're at. And for this particular person, I don't think treatment was what she truly wanted. What she truly needed, she was homeless. What she needed at that particular point was stable housing. So for me and for the team to uh, work with uh, Stepping Stones and get her into a temporary housing situation, um, I think improved her, her life at that particular moment. Um, she, uh, I do reach out to her periodically. She seems to be happier. She's more upbeat when I speak with her. Um, and she seems to be in a better place. Amazing the the gratitude that we receive uh, when we try when we go out and we explain what it is we do. Um, I won't use her words because uh, uh, she was uh, rather expressive and explicit <laughs> when she she first started the joke, um, and she didn't want me to essentially uh, give her hope when we put her. In her mind, may not have been, but uh, it's, it's impressive. Uh, the other uh, situation I'm thinking of is someone I know uh, watching him suffer from alcohol abuse, and uh, it's a it's a personal uh, gratification to see him uh, take steps to improve himself. So I guess that's what I've got to share. Yeah, and in more general, I guess, statements, it's been very humbling for us to go out and meet with these individuals. Um, getting out to these houses and their first reaction was, you know, you're not here to arrest us. And that's not our role. Our role is to really open up um, opportunities that maybe they didn't see were out there for them and to just kind of be a conduit for resources as well. Um, so maybe they don't know where to get stable housing or where they can go for food on a Thursday night, um, things like that. And that's really what our quick response team is doing when we go out to these houses, um, providing resources, even support. A lot of these people we follow up with on a daily basis, whether it's through text message or phone calls, just to make sure that they have the services they need and the resources that they need. Do you have any questions? So, hi, Daniel with WEU. Um, so, so I see that the plan, right, it's also um, the chief had mentioned that there will be plain clothes officers that will go into the community to try to get the, uh, the trust of, of those who you guys are trying to help. And as you mentioned just now, you know, the person, you had told you, you had told about this, you know, they were like, oh, you're not going to arrest us. So how exactly, you know, not even so much in the near future, but as, as time goes on, how exactly are you guys going to gain the trust uh, of those who are going through drug addiction? Because, you know, given the past, when people have gotten arrested, people have served jail time, 
even those who may have even caught, been caught with like small amounts of marijuana, those people have also been arrested and charged and everything, even though they themselves aren't addicted to drugs probably, or you know, positive, they're, they're just caught with like a dime bag of weed. So my, my question is, how exactly are you guys gonna go about making sure that the community members who will need the help will trust you guys? Uh, and, and just, I guess, forgive and forget everything that has happened in the past in regards to drug addiction. I think it's um, going to take some time. I think as our program um, moves forward, just seeing that we're out there, and like I said, we're not out there to arrest these individuals. We understand that it's a disease, and um, we want to help them in whatever way they can, and that starts small. And so like Aaron said, we meet people where they're at. And if they're, they're not comfortable with us meeting them at their house, we'll go meet them for coffee, maybe grab lunch and things like that to just kind of build. And we understand that people aren't necessarily, they might not be receptive to the program right away, um, but it's just, like you said, building that trust. Um, so we give them the information, our personal squad cell phones are on there, and they can reach out you know, when they are ready or do believe that we have resources that might help them. I think the other thing that, we, that, that uh, we're finding is, because it's not just Becca and myself. We have other members uh, who are part of this team who are actually present here today. Um, let me make sure that I see them first. The, uh, the fire department is uh, part of our team. So we have a medic from the fire department come and join us. We also have social workers from Human Services and we have a case manager from Harbor Place that joins. And sometimes the individual we might be speaking with, you know, makes that connection with, with us. Despite being Sometimes it's with the, the social worker, and sometimes it's with the medic. So, and I, I think when, when we talk with them in a, in as a team, you get that um, reassurance that we're not there to arrest them, that we're truly there. Uh, the other thing that we have been able to establish with our partnerships is when we do our work and we start to uh, document what we do and, and track and who we've worked with, who's done what connection, uh, the entry work uh, gets put into a separate database and a separate software system that's completely independent from our criminal investigative database. So oftentimes the clients and the people that we're dealing with uh, don't necessarily, they, they have said they don't care, but I always reinforce that, that you know, what they share with us will be kept private. And kept amongst the team and only shared with the, the, the people on our team to help coordinate um, the connection to treatment or whatever other service they may need. Hi there, uh, Katrina Lynn here with WPOW. So, um, so if, from what I understand, you know, you two have already started, you know, going out, talking with people who, you know, may have identified that maybe so has the response team, you know, the, the paramedic, you guys, um, sorry, I forgot to visit a uh, person of the team, have, have you guys as a team started already going out or you will start to go out as a response team together? Yeah, we have had a couple of deployments with the entire team um, going out already, and that's typically how it is. There are very few occasions where Aaron and I will just go out together, um, but we really encourage the entire team to go out just because, like Aaron said, there might be someone that connects with um, me versus the fire department or vice versa. So. And is there a response team that goes out every day, like every couple days? Like how often are you guys going out and seeking these people to identify that maybe people? A lot of it depends on, on the individual. So if there is a, a survived overdose, um, if it's a, an opioid related overdose, we try and make that connection within 72 hours. We're, that is our goal. Um, and other substances, you know, we may, uh, patrol may have been dealing with someone for years and years, and we get that, we start to uh, identify who those people are, and they get put on the list to try and make contact with and follow. So there, it's not that it's not important, but when people are vulnerable after a survived overdose, we want to try and make that connection and get them connected to treatments as quickly as possible. So it's kind of circumstantial. As far as like when we go out as an actual team, we're still trying to feel that out, like how often that needs to happen, uh, to what capacity, or what uh, uh, you know, we you know, really looking to make new 
context or are we trying to follow both already established contexts? Sorry, another question. Um, in terms of like experiences with, uh, so going back to drug arrests and stuff like that that happened in the past, have any of the members in, in the task force, uh, in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the team that you're working on, have anybody ever arrested anybody for drug offenses in the past? And if so, you know, how has this program changed their thinking in terms of like, you know, uh, tackling this issue? And would those team members also be transparent with the people they're trying to help today? You know, as, as a way to, to form that trust, like, you know, basically tell the person, like, yeah, I have arrested people in the past, but this program sort of changed my, my way of thinking, and, you know, like, that transparency and, and, and that past, like, is it there? Were you guys being transparent about that as well, with people are trying to help? Yeah, so we're always transparent with whoever we're out with. I mean, Aaron and I were both patrol um, officers prior to this. So there's going to be instances where we probably arrested individuals that we're talking with. Um, but I think coming at it from that honesty and explaining that we're growing as people. You know, maybe five years ago, we were arresting people for certain offenses. And now we understand that as agencies, we would rather help than hurt. And so that's why, as far as, I guess if you want to jump in, but it, we, we try to be as transparent as possible with individuals and just explain that we're all human and we're growing, just like law enforcement is growing and coming at things from a different perspective as well. I think the other thing I want to add to that is, uh, I think it's critical to understand that this is a component of the overall problem. And you know, the, this is not going to replace uh, drug enforcement. It's not going to replace the drug investigations that, that those investigators are out there working. Uh, this is a, a kind of a, a, a working concert. And the other thing I would like to say about it is all of us, and I would imagine everybody in this room knows someone, either personally in your own family or you worked with, who has suffered from substance abuse in the past. And I think for us, this has become a fantastic, I can only speak for myself, but in conversations with Rebecca, this has become a fantastic opportunity for me to not necessarily change my perspective, but allow the focus of what I want to do to be very narrow um, and uh, develop and, and I'm not saying it, but I want to say it here. <laughs> but essentially, it has allowed me to, to, to focus my efforts uh, and given me the opportunity to create options. And I think this position, and we've talked about this before, but this position has definitely reminded both of us why we got into law enforcement in the first place. Hi, I'm um, not sure if this question is more for you guys or maybe more for uh, Chief Atkinson, but is there a cost associated with having these new initiatives? Like, you know, <coughs> was there a cost to like get you guys through this training and stuff to, you know, of talking with people that need treatment or extra costs associated with extra hours to have, you know, you guys on the team going out. Um, yes, sorry, I'm not talking about the, like, the, <laughs> the money part. <laughs> yeah. I don't mind talking about the money part. So, yes, there, there's always a cost to it. Anytime that you have a new initiative that we have here with a good response team or the angel, at the end of the day, it takes people to be able to do it. So you do have a human resource cost that comes into it. Mayor Kniak had uh, mentioned earlier in his opening remarks about the remarks about the city council providing support in 2020, in March, this was about a week before Wisconsin went, to, went through a shutdown. The city council had provided some funding to be a partnership with our school district in Menominee area to add another youth services officer, as well as to provide some funding, a small amount, $15,000, to be able to provide potential wraparound services or diversion strategies, focusing in on youth at that time for the purpose of transitioning into adults or adding an adult component later on. So there was a monetary component. And then as we move forward here into 2023, it still has a monetary component. One of the most key aspects of that has been is because of that initial investment by both the city of Menominee and the, and the school district in the Menominee area, it helped us obtain a federal grant from the Bureau of Justice 
assistance for $584,000 to help provide funding to pay for uh, behavioral health officers, to help pay for software so we can keep our information separate from our criminal intelligence databases. We also had a, have a great partnership with our Dunn County Human Services. They helped acquire a juvenile a delinquency reduction grant for for $150,000 that allowed us to help do diversionary practices for our juveniles in the school district of Menominee area, and that has been very successful. So yes, there is a financial component to it, and if for whatever reason the, the grant money started to subside, there are still things that we can utilize and still keep this philosophy in order to provide people the help that they need. And, and frankly, I feel very confident too that because of the partnerships that we have built, and I will mention who those partners are here in a moment, that we'll still be able to make an impactful difference. And, and frankly, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that we have people like Aaron Berg and Beth and Maryfield that are willing to do this. I, I really wish these kinds of strategies were around 24, 25 years ago when I started policing. I, I can think of so many people that could have benefited from this. But sadly, we didn't know what we didn't know at that time. Now we do know, and it's incumbent upon us make those differences, make those changes, take a different approach, meet people where they are, and try to provide them the help they need, because everybody matters, everybody deserves a second chance, everybody needs hope. Okay. Um, just a few questions, just of course. to the future. Um, first one being, you know, how will the success be measured with this program later on down the road? Maybe not even a year from now, maybe five years from now, you know, when everything's in full swing. Secondly, um, what about those who have, are either currently incarcerated or have a record with drug offenses? Will there be anything done for those folks as well? And I guess, uh, thirdly, uh, well actually, first of those two questions, because I remember the third Okay, question. all right, all right. I'll do my best to answer, answer uh, uh, both of them. Well, I'll start first with the, the last one he asked about people that are currently incarcerated or currently have record, records. We, we have an absolutely amazing criminal justice collaborating division here in Dunn County. We have re-entry grants, re-entry programs that create housing opportunities for people that are coming out of prison, coming out of the jail, so that way they can try to re-assimilate themselves back into society while, while receiving treatment. And I see our quick response teams and ANGELS program also working with that group in the future to try to help provide those wraparound services so that way they can be successful. As far as things I think you're trying to get at, maybe expunging records or talking somewhere along those lines, that's handled through, through either the circuit court or the state, depending on which level you want to make those changes. Unfortunately, we don't, we don't have that power to be able to do that. You asked the question up front, though, and I want to make sure I get that right. Do you mind uh, repeating the very first part of the question? Oh, how are you guys going to measure success with this program? Very good, and that is important to measure success. So we're, right now what we're doing is we are looking back to the initial time when we received the seed money from the city council and the school district in the Nominee area, where we were working with our juveniles who are going through both uh, diversion and deflection, and I can talk about that in more in depth if you wish. Right now we're studying those people who are in the mentoring programs, how, how they've done in school, are they attending school, are they on pace to graduate, has their behavior increased to criminal levels, to let's say the students that actually did commit violations of the law that went through our diversion program to avoid being impacted by the juvenile justice system, were they able to complete the diversion program, what percentage was that, have they reoffended since then, and we want to be able to measure at the one, three, and five year marks to determine what levels of recidivism that we might have. And then as we're moving into this adult programming, which was this technically phase two of Project HOPE and the Quick Response Team and the ANGEL program is part of that phase two, we will also study the individuals that come into the program and seek that treatment. How long does it take for them to, to be able to complete treatment? Do they have any lapses? Do they have relapses? Do they offend during that time? What does that look like? We're looking at acquiring software to determine and measure attitudes, both of the people that participate in our program, as well as community members, and the people who actually work in the program, like law enforcement, social workers, psychologists. That's how we're going to try to measure this. 
And so we're working with the Department of Justice and the Center for Health and Justice to be able to track these items. Because it is important to determine, are they effective? Are they having unintended consequences? We don't think it will because of the studies that have been done in other communities. Nonetheless, though, it's, it's incumbent on us to make sure that we track and we're responsible for what we do. And I know you had another question that was brewing in there, so yeah. go ahead. So currently, right now, uh, what is the criminalization in terms of, of drug offenses and like that? Like, are we currently decriminalized here in Gun County? Um, and if not, then again, you know, just going back to the whole trust thing, you know, you, mm -hmm. your officers go out to people and be like, you know, hey, do you need help? And they, they get reluctant because it's like, well, it's still criminalized. I could still go to jail, you know, that sort of thing. And that's what I want to know. Where, where does the, where does your department stand on the whole decriminalization discussion of, of drug abuse? Well, I think you need to take a look at, at how that's impacted other communities. But to get to the first part of what your question was, is, is it decriminalized here in the county or the city? No, it is not decriminalized. However, though, much like any type of offense that we can encounter, whether it's a, a traffic offense or an ordinance violation, a lot of discretion is built into what the officers can do, whether they can give a warning, whether they can arrest, whether they can cite, or whether they can hold something in what we call abeyance. So if they're working through how we do our diversion, if a person, let's say we had a had someone with an offense that meets our criteria for diversion, we would just hold that offense in abeyance. And if they were able to complete the treatment program or evidence-based education piece that we use online, then they won't get a referral to the district attorney's office, they won't receive a ticket, they won't have that stigma of having their name appear on the Wisconsin Circuit Court access page, which a lot of employers will look at to see if there are arrests. And I, I can tell you one of the triggering factors years ago, and this, this is about seven, eight years ago, of why I started taking a look at this. What, one of those reasons was is a person who had gotten arrested for a, a minor possession of marijuana and drug paraphernalia. It was on a traffic stop, and it was a legitimate arrest by, by the trooper that made it. There's nothing wrong with it. They did. The person was an offender. They were convicted in court. Now this person, a couple years later, is trying to get a job. And he is being rejected for jobs just at gas stations to try to be a clerk. And I'm not trying to take anything away from being a gas station clerk. I've been a clerk. They, he couldn't even get a job at minimum wage for something like that. He did his, he did his penance. He paid his fines. He went to court. But now he can't even get employment for something like that. He went to treatment. So when we're, we're starting to take a, a broad look at our criminal justice system and how it's impacting others, I think that stigma piece is very important. And how we can try to help people avoid those kinds of pitfalls. Because it, it matters. People will look at that. And I, and I think that that person, along with many others, they deserve another chance. I mean, we want people to work. We want people to be able to support themselves. And here that person wasn't able to do so. I mean, to me, that's very tragic. Should that person have been punished for years over a simple possession of marijuana? I don't think so. But that's, that's me. I'd rather address the problem by looking at root causes, so that way they're not ever impacted by the criminal justice system. That way those who are impacted by the criminal justice system are your high-risk offenders, your sociopathic offenders, the ones who are violent. That's, that's what prison is made for. Prison's not made for, for treatment. That's just not what it was designed for. So let's look at some other alternatives. And I think programs like this that are occurring here in Dunn County and Menominee, along with across the United States, I really believe that this is the future for criminal justice. Strongly support it. Thank you for asking that question. Are there questions? Anything else? All right, well, I, I'm really, first in closing, thank you everybody for being here and giving us your time. It is really the greatest gift that anybody can give because we never get more of it. So for the fact that you are giving it to us today, it's just it's very humbling. I want to talk a little bit real quick and recognize our partners that have helped make this possible. 
City of Menominee Administration, City of Menominee Council, Menominee Fire Department, Dunn County Administration, Dunn County Human Services, Dunn County Criminal Justice Collaboration Division, Dunn County Sheriff's Office, Arbor Place Incorporated, Milkweed Alliance, Mentor Chippewa, the Machine Shed Weed Alliance, School District in the Menominee area, Core Data, QRT National, Operation to Save Lives, Mayo Clinic Health System, University of Wisconsin Stealth, the Police Assisted Addiction and Recovery Initiative, the Center for Health and Justice, the United States Bureau of Justice Assistance, the Wisconsin Department of Justice, and the Police Treatment and Community Collaborative, and finally, our community as a whole. So without their support, none of this would have been possible. Thank you everybody for giving us your time and support.